left uh, 30 minutes or so for discussion, questions and discussion. And I'm, I'm going to ask for those of you who do have questions or comments to make, to please identify yourself and your affiliation if you have one. Um, let me just repeat that uh, I'd ask you to keep your intervention short, one or two minutes. Um, and I apologize in advance because I will be cutting you off if, uh, if you go on longer than that, because we have so many people uh, who I know are going to want to intervene. And I just say too that um, we haven't heard much about uh, the humanitarian needs. This is the humanitarian policy group hosting this that are arising in South Kordofan and Abia and other areas. So I'm expecting some of the humanitarians in the room to, to raise some of these issues. Okay, um, I'd like to now open the floor and that also goes for our online audience um, who may be feeding in some questions as well. We'll take three or four questions, comments, and then defer those to the, to the panelists. And we have a microphone here. Let's start with this gentleman here, and then over here. Excuse me, sir. <coughs> Should I stand up or it's okay? Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Wendy. Uh, mine is uh, uh, a bit of comment and. Uh, Sorry, and could you just identify yourself for the yeah. rest of? Yeah, my name is Federico Voni. I'm from uh, Lead Sudanese Community Association. I'm uh, uh, from South Sudan and uh, married to a wife from North Sudan. So. See how, yeah. So you see how <laughs> how things are difficult, yeah. Uh, uh, before asking, uh, passing my question to uh, His Excellency the Ambassador, uh, just a, a, sh a short comment on. I totally agree with what uh, the uh, Doctor Bior and. Uh, uh, Ambassador Norbert say that uh, we need to see a f way forward. We need, we don't, we cannot afford any conflict and divisions. And uh, we need to work at, Sudan is dear to us all, whether from the south or from the north. Sudan remains dear to us. As it's been said that governments come and go, but uh, social relationship, people remain the relationship remains. So we have to be there to support this relationship. And here, my question then goes to, uh, uh, my address goes to uh, His Excellency the Ambassador uh, Azareg. Uh, I think international community are friends, are not enemies. As ambassador, you meet a lot of international figures they will chat with you, they will advise you, and you will drive wisdom from them. And I think your position is rather than keep supporting your government, sometimes a government can go blind. And, but the best thing is that you derive from this wisdom that you gather around the world and be advisory also to your government. I think that is a, uh, there was a, I remember, is it, oh, sorry. I'm sorry, you're running out of time. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> the, the question is that, uh, during the campaign in Al Baba Nusa, President Bashir said, we will win the election of Southern Kurdufan by ballot boxes or bullet boxes. And he said that a wise president would never say, what's your comment? Thank you. Okay, um, let's see, I think this gentleman here. Uh, yes, there are many people. So let, I'm going to, if I don't point at you this time, it will be uh, you, the next round. Okay, so you've got one, two, and three, and then we'll go the next round. Right. Uh, good afternoon, I'm Peter Moshinsky. I'm a journalist. I've been following Sudan for the past 30 years. I just came back from Juba last week, where I was very fortunate to be able to participate in the independent celebrations of the world's newest country. And I was just rather shocked to see President Bashir there, along with Ban Ki-moon and various others, whilst uh, there's, he's wanted for war crimes in Darfur. And it makes me wonder whether the election of the gov governor, Ahmed uh, Mohammed Haroun, who is also wanted for war crimes in Darfur, is it just a coincidence that the people of South Kordofan are suffering so much again? Is it a coincidence 
that the people of South Kordofan suffered so much in the last war, where they weren't able to get any international help. And is it a coincidence that there are hundreds of thousands of people now cut off from outside aid? Now, I know that the Security Council attempted to discuss this last Tuesday. They hardly came up with anything, and some of the permanent members said that there was no reliable information coming out of South Kordofan. Is that a coincidence? Is it because the outside community is not allowed to be there to witness? I mean, I know some of my colleagues and I, we've been distributing cameras to local people. We're, we've got evidences coming out. A colleague of mine presented President Bashir on the 9th of July with a dossier of, of photos from South Kordofan. The women and children chopped in half by bombs. The bombing of Kirchi Market. Say that again, please. Women and children chopped in half by bombs. By? Bombs, bombing, Antonov. I, I, I almost brought along a recording of the, 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 the people wa wailing. You would be shocked. I'm just wondering why this is not being taken seriously by the international community. What's the Security Council doing? What's the British government doing? What's the Dutch government doing? What's the government of South Sudan doing about this right now? It's absolutely appalling. Those are a few comments. Thank you. Um, let's see. Let's take this gentleman here and then this lady over here. And then we'll uh, refer to our panelists. Khalid <coughs> Nadim, uh, South Asia Middle East Forum. Thank you for all your presentations. Uh, I think it's very sad that from all the three speakers, uh, we've seen everyone pointing fingers at each other and everything. But we've got to look at solutions, how things are going forward. And I am very concerned that as we're talking about oil and the economy, this has to be sorted out because the people of North and South Sudan are both going to suffer if, if, if the North and South can't get together and discuss the question of oil and Abia. And, and it would be nice to hear from the speakers, from the representatives from the South and the North, about what you think is a, a solution to oil and Abia. Because no one's talked about solutions. We need to look forward, not backwards. Thank you. And the last question in this round, this lady over here, and then we'll do another round after we have the panelists respond. Can you get your microphone over there? If I'm waiting for the microphone, Caroline Potts, House of Lords, and also Humanitarian Aid Unit Passport. Part. Two quick questions. One is, um, our partners in Southern Kordofan, the NRRDO, have given us first-hand accounts of the atrocities being perpetrated in Southern Kordofan, um, the aerial bombardment against the civilians, the massacre, and the slaughter of people even outside the Ummis compound. Question please, the ambassador for Khartoum. Uh, first of all, why did you require, the re or reportedly require, the removal of Ummis forces from Southern Kordofan? How does that reassure the local people? And second, it's a question. Thank you very much. Um, may I ask what would be the... Why, oh, sorry, sorry, wh why was it reported that Khartoum requested the removal of UNMIS forces from southern Kordofan? Um, UNMIS. UNMIS. Thank you. And uh, secondly, what would be the response to the request many people have been putting to have a no-fly zone for uh, southern Kordofan to protect the civilians from the constant aerial bombardment and the massive displacement of over 70,000 people, many hiding in caves and in desperate humanitarian crisis? And very briefly, a second question. Uh, I was in uh, um, Bar Ghazal and uh, those other parts during the war many times and witnessed the massive slave raids. Whenever I return to southern Sudan, we're told that there are still many people missing, abducted during the slave raids. May I ask Dr. Luca if it's true that there are still many southern Sudanese missing, having been abducted in those slave raids? And might I ask the ambassador from Khartoum what happened to CWAC and what is currently being done to identify and return uh, those who are still believed and reported to have been missing, having been abducted uh, during those raids during the war? Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, I'll... Um because I think there were a couple of uh, interventions directed uh, to you, Ambassador. Okay. Please. <coughs> okay, thank you very much. Uh, I agree with all the friends who are uh, talking about the fact that we need to see the way forward. We need to have solution, we need to sit down and negotiate and avoid yeah. any military or violent you know, uh, endeavor. This will lead us nowhere. Uh, it's our policy to sit down and talk. We uh, 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 we will sit, with regard to the petroleum, for example, we will sit with our brothers from the South in Addis Ababa uh, uh, next month in uh, uh, December. December. Uh, 
September, sorry, and we will do our best to uh, find the solution. Uh, as uh, with regard to the question from my friend, who is married to a lady from the north, and he is from the south, I can understand, you know, the dilemma you are in. Nevertheless, we don't want it to be a dilemma. Okay, let us make it, you know, an example of how people can can come together and sit together and solve their their, their problems. I agree that an advisor and an ambassador has to be an advisor to his government, and this is my role. I'm doing my best to advise my government to adopt the most positive policies in my domain and my jurisdiction, jurisdiction. Thank you for your question. I, I agree with you that we have to look forward. The people are the ones who stays, comments goes and come. We have to concentrate on how to forge real relations between the people of the North and the people of the South. These are the real stakeholders. Uh, as uh, to what you have said, allegedly that al-Bashir said we will win the election through the bullet or the bullet or the bullet, the ballot or the bullet. No, he didn't say this. But he was talking. No, 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 just a second. Just a second. Just a second, please. Just a second, please. Okay, let's. It's okay. Let's, uh, no, no, just a second, please. Let's let yeah. the uh, ambassador yeah. respond. Thank yes, you. Yes, please. Yes. He didn't say this. He was talking to Arali, okay, after the threats that al Hilo was issuing, and it is only fair for, you know, a, a leader, okay, when he's, you know, somebody is threatening that it is either the, the star or the attack, it is only natural for a leader to say, if you want to attack me, I'm also a man, I'm ready to defend my people, okay? This is the context, we should not take it out of context. So he said it. We should not out of context. Okay, and he said also through the, the ballot box we are ready because he knows the support he got his at least his party got, and this is what happened after the election. After the election, his his party won, and Al Hilo, Al -Hilo uh, you know, lost, but he could not, uh, you know, uh, accept the result. This is really sad. Al Bashir did not say the way it has been put. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you. You finished? Oh, so I, you had another I have, question. Yeah, Sorry. Have, yeah, Sorry. yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, my friend here, they are, he said there are hundreds of thousands of people who have been cut from it. This is black propaganda. Baseless. Baseless. It has, it has no, no, because number one, we have our own NGOs, humanitarian, real humanitarian mm -hmm. NGOs, okay, working there to help the people. The government, okay, have done, has done its best to take people to their original, you know, place of abode where they are settling, and we'll continue to do this. These are our people, okay? And I don't think it is fair to accuse, uh, accuse me of, of abandoning my people. We will not abandon our, abandon our people. And as, as, as regards the, uh, what is called uh, uh, the aerial bombardment from her, her uh, you know, highness, or Her Excellency the uh, Baroness, I have full respect for you. But my friend, once I told him I would like to go and see Baroness Cox, he said to me, don't waste your time, even if you are Mother Teresa, she will not change her, change her, her mind. I'm really sad to, to see this. I hope I'm wrong, okay? But uh, 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 we are not bombarding the people. We have bombarded the, the, the rebels because what Al Hilo did, killing the civilians, confiscating the cars of the people, okay, and killing the people while, the, while they are, are you know, uh, praying, this is a criminality. He took to the bush and hiding in the caves, and the army is fighting him. We are not, nobody is ex expected, you know, a government to give a, a bundle of rose to somebody who is against democracy and who is killing civilians. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador. I'd like to give the floor now to uh, Dr. Luca. Yeah, I... Uh, First, I really sympathize with the position of the, uh, His Excellency the Ambassador, and uh, I, I, looking at him as a Sudanese, I think there's a sense that I want to come out. I think what Federico said is uh, that you are Sudanese. But in the process, it seems things becoming clearer whether you are a 
present, representing the, the people, so the government or the, the party. But that's not the issue. I don't want to get into some of the, your arguments because these are, I think there are a lot of gaps that I need not to, to bother about that one, of course. But let me go to what Bill said, ICC, the pattern. And I think what you are saying is the same pattern that happened in, in Darfur, ABA, Southern Kudufa, and maybe going also to, and what should be done by the international community. I think there's a very clear case of denial of access to the people. And uh, I think one thing which is very important, the raising the issue of human rights as very high as possible against the regime is very important. But even the, the member state, if you have such a reckless <coughs> members of the United Nations. I think it is very important to consider your diplomatic relation with such a country. And it is very important because morally it is good, I mean it is very important to have a stand about what, what is being done. But uh, the solutions, given the fact that during the war, being one of the people actually established NRDO, it is important to work with the non-governmental organization, indigenous organizations whether it is uh, NRDO or even the uh, Kush and RBA. And these are the organizations that we should be really supporting them so that they can be able to get the, the assistance to the people. But the international community, the issue of fly zone is very important. The United Nations Security Council, you the member of the state, to urge them for the non-fly zone because that's the only way you can be able to assist the organization to assist those people. Don't expect that Khartoum will be able to give you access to, 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 to the people of Nuba Mountain. And one of the things we have been saying is that give a, a safe haven for the refugees that will be coming from Nuba Mountain and Southern Blue Nile, especially the northern part of, uh, of, RBA, of, of, uh, of, of, of Southern Sudan. Coming to Khalid, I thought we have put a lot of suggestions, but let me be quite clear about the, what are the things that we are saying. Definitely a stable, a good relationship between the northern and the south requires a stable two states. The regime in Khartoum will not and shall not be able to promote the relationship with the North and the South. That's the fact. I think we'll be wasting our time. I mean, I'm come to that conviction that you cannot have good relationship with the existing regime in Khartoum. But what we are saying also is that let me give you some of the efforts that the SPLM has been exerting in order to have a soft landing for the economy of the North, but even to forge a new relationship between the North and the South. The, the, the President Mbeki help us a lot, what we call the post-cessation arrangements. But let me give you an example of the behavior of the government in Khartoum. One of the things that we said about the viability of two states is to have soft borders. What happened, that Khartoum closed the border, virtually. And actually what is happening, I think what, 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 what the ambassador was saying, it is right. Why, because you are hurting the people of Sudan by doing so, and shifting the focus of the people of South because South today is the economic nation, is the economic opportunities. But I, I don't imagine where the Sudan government, I mean Sudan, Northern Sudan will be threading with who? With Saudi, with Egypt, with Libya? I mean, I mean with Libya or Chad? I think the only opportunities is with the South. And here you have the president closing the border, hurting the, its own, I mean his, his own people. That's why we are committed as South that we want to have a smooth border and to have a smooth border in terms of, uh, of movement of good services and people and even animals. Second, we talk about the issue of, of citizenship. We are, are on a higher moral ground. We said we should have an option to choose to the people. And in our mind, we were saying that we have a very not less than two or three million people, nomads, going to the southern Sudan. And at least we should ensure for them these basic freedoms that we have agreed with Egypt the freedom to move, to own, to travel, and then to, to own. And, but but the, the Khartoum government rejected that. And we said because you have to have even dual citizenship so that you allow the people be, be, between the north and the south. They rejected that one. They came with a very medieval perception of that they have purified the north. But the, the remaining north now is only Arabs, Muslim, forgetting the people of Nuba, the Darfur, the eastern Sudan. Now they're purified. They have, yeah, <laughs> that is, there's no way you can have such a state. Imagine Sudan to say this is going to be pure Islam, Islamic and pure Arab. Unless you talk about other Sudan, that I don't know. 
But that is the thinking in the, uh, about the citizenship. Look at the issue of currency. The currency, we said we have to have a smooth way of, 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 of bringing the, the currency. And we agreed even, the process. By the time we're doing this one, they were planning their own currency in, in, in Khartoum. What they're doing? Because the South of Sudan is having not less than two billion US dollar. This is equivalent to the Sudanese pound. And what they're doing by issuing a new currency, they're telling to the South, whatever you are going to redeem with your new currency, just useless papers. And these are liability of the Central Bank of Sudan. And we said, what is this? Because even the IMF advised us what we should do to use the redeemed Sudanese currency in order to promote the trade between the North and the South. And they wage a real economic warfare against the South. Oil. We talked to them about the issue of soft landing and they want, they want to continue with the wealth sharing agreement. I was in those agreements. And they said, look, you know, we asked them, what do you want? You know there will be a big impact of the oil of uh, secession. Yes. Can we now we can consider assistance? They said we can, don't talk to us about assistance. When the South started becoming like IMF and World Bank, they said this is the oil of the South, and we would like to assist you. They are even refusing for the South to assist the North. They said this is their right, and we should continue with the same arrangement for the wealth sharing. But the South is ready even to discuss for the soft landing for the economy of the North, because we are very concerned about the issue of the Northern Sudan, the, the people of Northern Sudan. Dead. I'm one of the people on this issue of acid, on the subcommittee on assets and, and liabilities. And we agreed for an option that we are going to work together in order for the debt relief for Sudan. Look at the behavior they did in Southern Kurdufan in ABA. How, how can we go and convince the creditors now to tell them really this country, we need to have a debt relief for this country? So this is a country is becoming a real liability. And, we, and we, we tried our level best to the last minute to assist them to forge a good relationship with the North and the South. So uh, let me come to the last, last point right. about yeah. uh, uh, <laughs> Barrel of Scorps. I think the issue of, uh, I'm one of the people, I raised this issue a long time ago. In the process of uh, counterinsurgency warfare, I think a large number of innocent children and women abducted. And as we talk today, they have, they have not less than 20 to, to 30,000 children abducted in actual situation of slavery in the hands of the Arab militia in northern Sudan. And it's good that you brought up this issue, because these are the people we don't know what is going to happen to them. The report itself by an organization called SIWAT presented to the, to the office of the president, to the presidency, recognizing it that this is a problem. I think it is an issue that we need to keep in our mind when we talk about the... But I want to echo another issue also about the... If, despite the fact this Missyria and the Arab normals have been used badly by Khartoum, again we say they have been dragged into this war and they are actually victims of the very government using them. And that's why we are on a higher moral ground to ensure that the Missyria should have a free access and movement to pasture and water in southern Sudan. It is our responsibility in the South to ensure the livelihoods for these people. So. Thank you. Now, <laughs> we are, we have uh, in our official time scale about three minutes left, but we have half an hour which we've dedicated also to networking and refreshments. We can cut into that time if you would like to for more questions or are you happy to do that? Seeing some nodding? Okay. Yes, I see many hands also. So let's carry on. Um, Ambassador, are you happy for us to take a few more questions and then you intervene, or would you sure. like to make a comment sure. now? No, well, either way you want, you're the boss. Okay, well, <laughs> let, let's take a, if you don't mind, because we talked about it earlier, and I know you wanted to give the maximum time to our, yep. Uh, yep. our fellow presenters. So let me just uh, see if I can do a selection. It's going to be difficult. Um, <laughs> yes. Um, what I'd like to do, if, if you don't mind, those of you who are members of the respective sort mm -hmm. of missions, is to give some time to no, just no the other people okay. first. There's okay. one person here, um, this gentleman here behind, this <laughs> man over here, and this lady here. So let's start there. And again, if you are able to stay for coffee tea, if you're not fasting during Ramadan, then there's time to, to talk, I hope, to our speakers a little bit afterwards. Please, okay. keep it very brief, please. Okay. Thank you. Uh, my name is Awad Khamis Waran. 
Um, I work in uh, the Nuba Mountains as a community-based organization together with um, NRADIO. I'm very happy that uh, Carol has uh, brought, the, uh, brought the name here. Uh, it's just a comment uh, because um, I have been there when Kauda was bombed. I was the one of the people who were lying on the floor because the antenna was bombing down. And um, and uh, I'm, I'm just uh, really worried that the ambassador uh, doesn't seem to know that people are dying. There are, um, there are videos. He talked about distributing these videos around. They came out into the world and uh, civilians have been killed. And now there is um, no access to the mountains. So if you don't know this, I'll tell you, because I came from there. And you should, if uh, you want to advise your government properly, you should know uh, all this um, information first. And I suggest, uh, I assume that um, everything that we're going to tell you now, you're going to deny it. So I think I will, I will just Why talk to, <laughs> because you're denying that you're not bombing the civilians in the Nova Mountains. You're denying that there are no, uh, 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 more, he said more, se more than 70,000 people are denied access um, to North Sudan. They don't have food. There's no commodities in the, in the markets. You see? So um, I just assume that you're going to deny everything. So. <laughs> Um, please, uh, <laughs> please uh, wind up now. Yeah. Yes, please. So the, the question is for the community, for the international community. What are they going to do about this? Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, how about this lady here, since she's nearby? I think uh, you had a comment to make. Uh, my name is uh, Ludia Butrus Shokai, and I live in Leeds. I'm a psychiatric nurse. I work in Leeds, and I am from the Nuba Mountains, and I'm married to the man from the <laughs> south. <laughs> um, uh, in your um, speech, uh, you said that um, um, uh, you said that in, in the Nuba Mountains, when you know they were during the election campaigns, uh, Al Hilu and his uh, people they were saying that uh, either uh, the star or the attack. You said that, and you said that uh, they were the leaders. They were threatening uh, the voters so that they can uh, be with them. But I can say to you that this is uh, wrong. This is not right because myself, I was there. I was in the campaign at that time, and it was you know the people themselves. They were like shouting that you know they were shouting and saying that you know either you know the the star or the attack. There, the people themselves. None of the people. Uh, from Malhelu or they were when uh, the people who were with him, none of them were saying that. Uh, so I just want you know to bring this to, into your attention. The other thing is that um, uh, your president uh, Omar uh, Al Bashir uh, say uh, earlier this year uh, in Al Gadarif uh, that after the separation, uh, the only uh, religion in Sudan is going to be Islam, and the only uh, culture is going to be and the Arab uh, culture. Uh, myself, I am from the Nuba Mountain. I am an African a woman, and uh, we have a lot of African Nuba tradition which are completely different uh, from the Arab uh, tradition, and we speak our uh, different uh, languages, dialects, a lot of things, we do, and we have our traditions. Uh, so uh, uh, my question is that, you know, how can we trust you know, the government uh, to protect our rights as uh, citizens? Uh, number two, uh, is that um, your president as well uh, says that you know uh, uh, if uh, uh, Al Hilu and his people they rebel, we are going to chase the Nuba people, uh, cave, cave, a mountain, a mountain. The Nuba people. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, cave, cave, a mountain, and mountain. Uh, my question is that is this what they are doing now? You know, so that they can you know like implement what Al Bashir mm -hmm. said. Thank you. And this gentleman over here. Again, please try to keep your, oh, okay, we'll have this gentleman and then this one over oh, here, sorry. sorry, yes. And, and please keep <coughs> your intervention short, because sure, we're really short that. on time. Uh, my name is Suleiman Rahal. I am the director of Nuba Survival Foundation, which is based in London. And I was born and raised in Kadugli, and Kadugli is named after my great-grandfather. So I know a lot about what's happening inside Sudan today, up to this minute. <coughs> well. What the, our ambassador said that uh, they are sending 
humanitarian aid to the people down there in the Nuru Mountain. I just spoken to one of my nephew yesterday, uh, asking because we see so many trucks going down the uh, and asking whether these uh, trucks are uh, going to help the people. He said, no, I'm working in this organization. And what is happening that we're taking this food to the military and to the uh, popular defense force and to the militia. So nothing is going to the Nuva as such. So that make your uh, make your position very clear about this humanitarian. So there is a dire need today in the Nuba mountain for the humanitarian assistance. And we would like to see uh, this is being an urgent and immediate uh, actions to be taken on regarding this humanitarian access. And I think what Peter Majenski said and what uh, Baronowski said was quite right. And I don't want to go over it again because it is true that the suffering of the Nuba has mounted into the ethnic cleansing. And people are now, even I've got the picture, people are living in caves and children in particular where they can't come down because of this bombing, the continuous bombing indiscriminately and killing so many innocent people. We got videos, we got BBC's gone there, at, uh, the Jazeera International went there, and the USA satellite group is monitoring the things. And even today, the, uh, the bishop and Dudu, who fled from Kadukli, Bishop Kadukli, who witnessed the mass grave himself and giving that testimony in the the Congress. Sir, so if I'm sorry, I'm going to have to... Um, oh, sorry, my, my last question to the ambassador yeah. from Holland, uh -huh. please. Yes. And what the international community will need when there is a mountain evidence to suggest the war crimes is being committed for the second time in the Nuba Mountain, what the international community is doing to protect the Nuba because they have the duty to protect them. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay, this gentleman over here has been patiently waiting. And then Thank we're going to uh, refer back to the panel. Thank you. Uh, Charles Gurdon. Um, I've had an interest in Sudan since the uh, mid-1970s, um, and uh, my father lived there for 14 years or so. A uh, couple of things. First of all, uh, it's been said that uh, diplomacy is the art of lying for your country. The ambassador is an exceptionally good diplomat. Um, <laughs> if disingenuous is perhaps a more diplomatic word. Secondly, uh, just to say that unfortunately the international community Which you're talking about. No. <laughs> <laughs> the, the international community will do nothing. Unfortunately, Syria, Libya, the current debt crisis, the riots outside mean that uh, Sudan will become, and the Nuba Mountains and South Kordofan will remain very, very low in terms of priorities. And I suggest that actually, unfortunately, nothing will be done. Thank you. Um, let's uh, refer to the panelists now. If I could ask um, everyone to keep their interventions, you know, very short. I know there's a lot to say, and everybody has, uh, you know, very strong feelings. But we we've almost run out of time. I'm going to actually ask uh, Ambassador Bakus to respond to those questions directed to him first. I pick up two. Um, I pick up two uh, two issues. One is the um, humanitarian side, and the other the human rights side. On the humanitarian side. Um, just a little reminder, Kadukli counted about 120,000 inhabitants before the war started, there must be 2,000 left. Now, these people have gone somewhere, or underground, literally, <laughs> or they have fled somewhere else. Moreover, we know that there are people who have gone away because of bombardments, because of the war, because of what they fear. Uh, the themselves do not damage that much, but what they do is inspire fear. They're instrument of fear. The, the bombs take more than one minute to go down, you normally can see it coming, and you can get pretty much out of the way. And people have fought for 19 years of war, and they know how to do it to some extent. But the fear is what makes you move. Uh, and those from the Nuba Mountains, I see some, uh, some heads nodding, they know it. So yes, there are people on the move. And if I take WFP, UNHCR, and UNICEF, with whom we work intensely and whom we fund intensely, they count in the tens and tens of thousands. of People are on the move, and that cannot be reached. Now, it's evident that something needs to be done. In some areas, we start now to do it. There's an agreement on some part in the southeastern side of the Nuba Mountains between both the, the government and uh, the SPLM to, to bring some assistance. So we are uh, moving towards that now ourselves. Uh, we are also chairing the three areas uh, group and looking into it in combined effort to, to bring new military assistance. But when the parties fight and close up the area, we cannot put our war planes there and our tanks and move in, right? 
So the answer is easy. You can go as far as you can go under the present conditions. And we try to push as hard as we can to go further. And in the end, you cannot leave a lot of people just die. So something needs to be done. And something is being done, by the way. But it's difficult. So, um, and I think both parties need, both parties, I say, need to make sure that access can be granted. Because both parties have their reservations. But that's in a war not abnormal and happily enough. So we are really pushing for it. But we know that there are people that need urgently to be assisted and we try to do it. Um, on, on, that, uh, on that one. The second one is on human rights issue. On the 30th of June, a provisional unmissed report on human rights situation in Southern Kordofan has been made internally. It has not yet been fully finalized. I have the draft here. It contains extremely interesting recommendations. I cannot spread it because it's under embargo. But, um, so sorry for you, but <laughs> the final version, and when I hear, of course, uh, the head of DPKO is saying in a uh, Security Council meeting um, that he is not certain about anything, then that is to some extent true, maybe to some extent not true, but we all know that human rights uh, violations need sound proof, otherwise you get a war of words, of words. And that is a nightmare scenario if you want to make sure that something is being done. So one of the worst things with human rights violations is that you need accuracy and proof before you can move to action. It's simple, but it's also very complicated. Now, there's contrary to what you might think, um, a lot is being done at this moment. And to give you a little reference, uh, I just got a, uh, the day before yesterday, my director general and myself, we got a mail from a Dutchman who's been for 15 years in Eritrea, extremely active. Wikileaks now has opened up in Eritrea, and after 10 years he offered us his, uh, he offered us his excuses saying, I all of a sudden discover that you were seen as the, the most difficult country when it came to human rights respect in Eritrea, but we never knew it. No, because of a lot of these things do happen underneath. And that is, for the time being, what we can do. But it's clear that both sides, I think, need to show full willingness to address these issues because it doesn't honor, honor any of the sides <coughs> when you discover that human rights issues have been occurring. So yes, on human rights, there is a lot that's being done. There are strong recommendations in the report, and I hope they will be kept uh, up kept once the report comes out, and I hope it's, it's in its finalizing stages, but it can take some time, and I hope that that will set the record and will move the Security Council to make sure that there is something being done. But you will probably need an international commission of inquiry because the parties, of course, and that's normal in a war period, will not agree over the issue. So you'll probably need to have a look from the outside and I think we will make a strong appeal to both sides to allow these, uh, such a commission to come in, to go and, and talk to everybody and get facts on the table. So that is the procedure that can work. But once again, in a war situation, both human rights and humanitarian access are two of the most difficult issues at stake. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank sir. you. Thank you very much. Uh, my friend, uh, Dr. Luca, said that uh, we have closed the border between the North and the, and the South. Yes, we did. But you know why? Because uh, instead of making the border a bridge between the north and the south, from which you know benefits go to those both sides, our uh, <coughs> brothers in the in uh, from uh, SPLA, okay, sponsored, you know, the rebels from the uh, uh, South Kordofan and the rebels from Darfur. Uh, only two uh, on the eighth, I think, of this month, okay, they brought them together in Juba and sponsored them to sign a, an agreement of an. No, 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 listen. I'm saying in Juba, but but they are, you know, they don't want to be blamed for that, so they call it Kauda, Kauda Agreement. It took place in Juba. People were, we have seen the pictures also. People were sitting in a fancy, beautiful rooms, which is not existing in Kauda. But the border became, you know, uh, you know uh, a way of bringing the arms for the, for the, for the rebels in South Kordofan and therefore, okay, to candle, uh, I mean, uh, the the fairs of war. This is not in the benefit of both sides. Okay, it's only natural when the border brings you a problem, you close the border. We, this is not our policy. We said it twice and thrice, and we say it again. We want soft border, we want good relation, but the newborn said should not use the border to support the rebellion. Instead of helping us bring this, they are helping the rebels to flare the fears of war and and death and crisis. This is quite unfair from their part. 
we uh, and he's uh, talking about about uh, about uh, you know uh, citizenship only two weeks ago 15,000 families from Rufa'a Arab has been expelled from the south they stayed in the south at least 20 years they have been expelled we haven't expelled a single northerners from the north and we will never do this we will never do it we haven't done it okay because this is punishment for the people if we have a problem with 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 with, with some politicians from ABA, that doesn't mean you punish your people with whom you have relation we have my brother here okay uh, from the south marrying a sister from the north from the from the north this is commonplace we cannot cut these relations because of some propaganda of some NGOs who were in reality advocacy groups who would like to advance their own agenda, okay, we will not do this. It, we haven't done it. Now, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, SPLM, okay, is very much preoccupied, okay, very much preoccupied with the war in southern Sudan, okay, and now they are talking about the atrocities of war. They are contributing to expanding the war and speaking about the atrocities of war. This is a contradiction. This is quite unfair. As with regard to the purity of Islam and purity of Arabs, we, nobody can say this because you cannot say about purity of Islam because this is against Islam. We didn't. We know Islam. We cannot say pure Islam, okay, or purity of Arabs. This is racism. And racism is against Islam. We haven't done it. We will not do it. If, you, if somebody would like, you know, to propagate, you know, just wrong idea about somebody whom we don't like, this is another story. But nobody talked about pure Arabs. And by the way, our, our Arabism is a cultural one. I'm classified Arab. The gentlemen in front of me here are classified Arabs. Hmm? Arab. they, they, uh, I remember, no, no, I'm talking about two gentlemen here, okay? <laughs> I, I, I remember, I, took, I have a story, very short story. I took a delegation when I was, I was uh, a diplomat in Nairobi, okay? A delegation comprised of uh, the Minister of uh, uh, Trade, uh, and, 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 and his people from the Minister of Trade in, in Kenya. When we went to, there to Khartoum, after three days, Mr. Kamau, my friend, from the Minister of uh, Com uh, Trade in, in Kenya, asked me, Abdullahi, where are these Arabs they are talking about in the papers in Nairobi? These people are just Kenyans, and he's right. We are Africans, we are proud to be Africans. This cannot be denied. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, finally, I'm sorry, we're really far out of time, so I'm going to give Dr. Luca Biong the last word here. We had only one uh, comment, which I'll read out just quickly. I don't think we have time to <coughs> respond to it, but this is from Max in Sri Lanka. He says, was the expulsion stroke deregistration of 13 international NGOs in 2009 really about removing eyes and ears from the three areas? Unless you say okay to this, I would plan to thank him for his question, but note that time sadly has been against us on this occasion. Oh, actually, that's Malcolm's uh, input, isn't it? <laughs> anyway, um, I don't think, Ambassador, we have time to answer that question, but I'll just leave that with you. Um, Dr. Luca, would you like to have the last word? It's now, we've got, we've got very little time left. We still have time for a quick cup of coffee afterwards, but yeah. please go ahead. Yeah, I really I want to thank uh, all of you for coming and and also for the ambassador of Sudan for the difficult task for him and um, I appreciate his uh, his comment and for you Wendy and the ODI I think it is it is critical what what we discussed today is is a real issue and is a is a is a concern is is a threat is about people. And I think the biggest question for all of us in this hall, what can we do in our private, as individual, as organizations, as people who have also their governments? I think this is the message that we want to see, what is happening in Nuba Mountain, in, in ABA. But indeed, the future of the two states is a big challenge. And we can do something. And I think it is critical that we should raise our voice very high about the atrocity being committed in these countries as individuals and even to, to, to raise the issue of human rights abuses. And I, uh, we will be waiting for the report of the United Nations. But I think we need not to, to wait so long. And we don't need even verification in order to say whether there's a there's atrocity committed or not, because are committed, are being committed. I think there's no any. So really, we should make the Sudan government responsible in the eyes of the international community 
that one we can do it. Raise our, let us raise our voice very high. They, they will hear eventually. ICC is waiting one day, one day. I think these leaders who are committing these atrocities will appear one day in ICC. I think I'm confident and that one should happen if we collectively work together. Second, I think it is important as we are going <laughs> that it is important that we should really question our diplomatic relation with such government that, that is killing its own people. It is a high time that we should go for that one. Third, let us focus in terms of access to humanitarian assistance to these people. I think the NGOs, the indigenous organizations are important so that they can be able to access to the people. I think these people are in, in their need for, for assistance. I think the last point, let us work together. Again, the only option for Sudan is peace and stability. The only option for Sudan is good relationship between the north and the south. I think we are confident a day will come that we'll be able to ensure Sudan is stable, we ensure that the two states are not vi are viable, that the people of the two states are actually forging ahead and nurturing a long history of relationship. And thank you very much. I'd just like to thank all of our speakers for, uh, for their contributions today and to thank you for coming.